Hello and welcome to Love and Lordship Live on this Friday the 13th. I'm Greg Williams and I'm looking forward to great things as always in the Lord, regardless of what anybody thinks or claims or superstitions about Friday the 13th. It's going to be a great day, okay? I hope you are as well. We thank you for joining us. Um, now, the last few weeks, we've been really focusing in on the highest of human relationships, which is marriage, key foundational principles and points, issues from God's Word that when it comes to love, relationships, marriage, sexuality, those kind of things, okay? Now, you can go back and look for all those articles. There's four or five of them, and there's two pair of pants. Who wears the pants in your family, right? Got to know who those are. Serving is loving is authority. Uh, unconditional love, last week, forgiveness and trust, and there are others. So go to www.loveandwardship.com, all spelled out, and uh, you'll see those articles and podcasts and videos and audios. So this week, we're jumping into some deeper waters. And let's just say, somewhat controversial text of scripture when it comes to how they're interpreted and what people say about them, especially when it comes to marriage, divorce, remarriage, and adultery. Now, we're going to go deeper on in these, as I've always promised you, and we continue to do that. And in the book, uh, The Authority of Love, we talk about this, and I give all the scriptures. You can go back on this article and find all the scriptures for this as well. Uh, but remember, God's Word tells us that marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled. He's talking about the institution and covenant of marriage and relationships and sexuality because honoring marriage happens long before we say I do. Okay? For God will judge all the sexually immoral, pornea, all right, the adulterers, don't know that Greek word, but it's in there, okay? And the fornicators are those who are promiscuous. And we've already established that most of us in our day and time have been guilty of that. But here's the beauty of it. There's always God's grace. Not so that we can go, well, he's fine with it. I'm going to go do it again. Uh, uh, Paul expressly forbid it. Don't use grace as a license to sin. Okay? But we need to know. So we're going to dive right in to what God's word and his covenant order. And that's important. That he has an order in the covenant. And you find it not only in his word, but the way that things are, are expressed and what he tells us about sexuality, marriage, relationships, adultery, divorce, and remarriage. All of it, I pray in truth and grace. That's my prayer as I share this and as you receive it. So let's look at what God's Word says on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and adultery. All right? I, I'm going to close this section out on marriage for now, all right, with what God has to say about these things. And it's by no means exhaustive. And there is certainly room for some interpretation. But we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. But the temptation in interpretation, as with anything in our lives, is when we're given the opportunity to have a say on it, we tend to move toward our flesh and what makes us happy. That is prevalent not only in our culture, but it's even prevalent in many of our churches. We'd rather you keep coming and hearing it, so we'll say it this way to keep you coming. Rather than, and I call that the happiness translation, okay? But if we're not certain on something, wouldn't it make more, much more sense as believers in Christ, as disciples of Christ, to go, wait a minute, what other things are said in relation to these topics and these issues that move us toward God's holiness? The holiness translation. So I, I, whenever there's an interpretation, I'm always looking to see if people or churches or individuals are moving toward happiness to make people feel better or toward holiness. And I would make the claim that we ought to choose holiness because it brings us closer to God. That may be difficult, but it requires more self-discipline, self-control, and humility. But aren't those all good things, fruits of the Spirit, and things that we're called to in order for God to be on our side and working in us and through us and for us? Rather than pride and feel good. All right. So with all that said as sort of an intro here, uh, I, I want you to... I want to, us to remember this, that we're not striving to just make you feel comfortable here. I want you to know God's truth on this with regards to everything he says about it, so you will understand what it means to be in his word as his disciple, to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because I've seen this happen, and I deal with it all the time with couples that have gone through these things. So as I've prayed and studied over the years, 
here's where the Lord has led me with regard to these controversial issues that must be wrestled with in order to give biblical guidance in today's culture and even in today's church. I do so here in some seven succinct points, all right, with related scripture, and I don't have them in the comments this time because there's a lot, so go back to www.loveandlordship.com and you can pick this article up and have all of these for your own study and prayer. And I would love to hear what you think about this. Give me your comments back. I'll, I'll be glad to discuss that and talk through that with you and hear what you have to say and get some feedback on this. So I appreciate that. But I, I can tell you that next week, I'm going to give you a real-life story that came out of this ministry, and it's actually in the book as well, The Authority of Love, that confirmed this. It's been confirmed many times, but never as powerfully as it was in the story that I'm going to share next week on Love and Worship Live. So, Lord willing, we'll get to do that again. Hopefully you can share this, what, what we're talking about today, and the practical application of His Word, and then see how it was lived out and the difference that it makes. So here we go, strap yourself in, because this is a holy roller coaster ride, okay? And like a, a heavenly fire hydrant right here, all right? Fire hose, maybe, all right? Number one, we need to understand that this is where every bit of it begins, and when we do a happiness interpretation, oftentimes we move away from this without God's blessing. We call it grace, but it's moved away from God's truth, okay? Number one, God ordained marriage right from the beginning, as a reflection of his image in a lifetime covenant. Let me say that again because that's the foundation for everything. God ordained marriage to reflect his image right from the beginning as a foundation for everything else. Okay? Marriage, relate family, relationships, love, sex, church, influence, all of it began in a garden with one man and one woman in a covenant relationship to reflect God's unity. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and His love for us. And it's in a lifetime covenant, and He showed that all throughout the Old Testament in His covenant with Israel, and now our covenant with Him in Christ in the New Covenant, the New Testament, in the blood of Jesus. Genesis 2.24 and Matthew 19.4-6 speak to that. Marriage, number two, is also, a, and I just said it, a symbol of God in Israel, husband and wife, and Christ and his bride, the bridegroom and his bride. And he's, when, we, when, when this is all over, when history is done, in eternity we get to step into that forever. We're already in it, but we can step in and consummate it completely. We're going to have a wedding feast. That's because the bridegroom is going to come and get his bride. And he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, that's marriage language. That's covenant language. I am fully committed to you in covenant, in covenant with you, and I will return and bring you back to my place. Right? Uh, Je Jeremiah 31, 31, and 32 talks about God as a husband to Israel. And Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 talks about Christ and his bride, the church. All right? I've heard, you've heard me say this before. I actually did a, a, a live on it. The Bible is not only the greatest love letter ever written, it's the greatest marriage manual ever written because everything in it is written to or about God and Israel, Christ and the church, or a man and woman in marriage is a foundation of all other loving relationships. Doesn't mean you have to get married, but that's where we're supposed to see it. And the churches have not done a great job on that. We've allowed so many compromises that we're not showing the world. That's why the, the homosexual agenda came forth and said, don't tell us about your marriages. You don't have, you don't have a foundation to stand on. We've seen what your, your marriages are like. So don't tell us about that. We've got to do a better job of that. Number three, God hates divorce because it is the breaking of a covenant. It is a violent act in Malachi 2.16. He says, I hate divorce because you broke the covenant. You were violent against the wife of your youth. That's what he thinks about it. Divorce is a sin. All right? We need to see it for what it is. Then we can confess that like we do any other sin and be forgiven of it. All right? But so often we go, well, if there's reasons, biblical or scriptural reasons for divorce, we're going to talk about this just in a minute, that that doesn't hold water according to the full context and truth of Scripture. God hates divorce because it's the breaking of a covenant, which means it does not symbolize who he is with us. And that's what he created it for. Number four, there are many reasons that Moses allowed for divorce, and God gave Moses the opportunity to, to allow for divorce. All of them are found in this one phrase, 
because you have hard hearts. Now, I ask this question every time I teach this. You ever have had, come out, have you ever had a hard heart? A lot of H's in there, okay? Got it. Have you ever had a hard heart over money, pride, jealousy, envy, and, and the list could go on? And every single time, by the time I get done with about two or three of those, every hand in the room is up. Yes, I have. That, you, that, that is a reason why God allowed for divorce to happen because two people supposed to be in a covenant and then allowing these other things to enter in. And then I ask this, how about sex? Has that ever been a problem? Oh, yeah. Hard heart's there. Probably the hardest, okay? So there are many reasons why God allowed Moses to give a writing of divorce and not just one, okay? Marriage, therefore, requires serious forethought and consideration before we enter into it. If we would teach the truths of Scripture, we would ordain this for, this covenant for, but his purpose throughout the human humanity and, and history for God to be able to show us what this looks like in marriage. Matthew 19, 7 through 10 says that he allowed you, Moses, to give that writing of divorce because you have hard hearts. And when you have hard hearts, your hearts begin to harden, then you begin to do this in marriage. And it's supposed to be the most intimate, most loving covenant relationship that represents God and his people. And when we have hard hearts, that begins to break down. So there's an allowance for it, but it's still a sin. Number five, there is to happen hard hearts. He allows for divorce. And in Matthew, he, t he talks about Matthew 19, 9, I believe it is. He talks about the fact that if you give, if you divorce your wife, men could do that only at that time. If you divorce your wife, then you must give her a writing of divorce. The reason for that was the Shema rabbinical school was very conservative, basically uh, agreeing with what Christ was saying here. It's not about the law. It's about the, the creation and the covenant that God began with. We'll see that in a minute in Jesus' response when they tried to trick him on this. And, but the Hillel rabbinical school was teaching a very liberal thing. Even I had a, a, a Messianic rabbi tell me this one time that they'd gone so far in the Talmud, the written traditions that were added to the Torah, the written law, they'd gone so far as to basically say it this way in English. If your wife burns the toast, you can divorce her. I'm not guessing a woman wrote that or, or spoke that law, okay? They had it in. Why? Because men were getting upset and they, their wives weren't making them happy. Here we go with the happiness translation, right? So i got to come up with something. So if they're not making me happy, which is their sole purpose, right? Wrong. There's much more to it than that for both of us in, in a covenant relationship. But they came up with this to say, if they don't make you happy, they burn your toast. That's a reason for you to get a divorce. And Jesus knew what they were trying to do and said, you need to make sure that if that woman has been sexually immoral, that shows up in the writing of divorce. And if she has not been, it's because you burnt the toast. She burnt the toast. Make sure that shows up in the writing of divorce. Historians have, have solidified that over and over again. That this wasn't about saying, well, if there is sexual immorality, which by the way, the word Greek word was not adultery. Many Bible translations use that to reinforce what the churches were doing over the last hundred years. The word is actually pornea, which is all sexual immorality, which means it can refer back to the fact that, that she lied about being a virgin before she was married, or that there were some other things that went on, okay? Sexual immorality of any kind brought to the forefront, disclosed, means that you could hard heart and divorce, but you better proclaim that in the writing of divorce, okay? Because if you don't do that, then the next man doesn't know that. And again, women, Christianity was the greatest women's live movement ever. Women were set free. They now could divorce if there was hard hearts, okay? That became a part of it in the law, okay? But we got to understand that each one of these things is a sin. It's a divorce. It's a breaking of the covenant, all right? Two other things, abandonment. Uh, the unbeliever leaves the marriage. That is a reason you can get a divorce, but it doesn't say after that you can get remarried. It just says you're free from that legal marriage, that covenant there. You've gotten free from it, but it's still a sin, all right? Third one, abuse in marriage. Not directly addressed, by the way, in Scripture, but certainly leads to hardness of heart and addressed in other areas about how we treat one another. So there's an even deeper issue there when we dig deeper. So these are reasons that lead to hardness of heart. So any one of them 
could be a reason, and many others, to a reason for divorce. The problem is we've made it so easy and so lighthearted and not the seriousness of the covenant for people entering into it. Divorce is so easy that it's become prevalent in our culture and even in many of our churches. So we have basically tossed the covenant that God designed to the side. That does not fit his word or his truth at all. Okay? There is only, by the way, number six, one allowance for remarriage in 1 Corinthians 7.39. If your spouse dies, you are not only free from that because they no longer have another party in the marriage, but Paul, under the Holy Spirit, specifically said, you are free to remarry. Why wouldn't he say that in the other ones? Because he knew that divorce was a sin and that remarriage, as Mark and Luke, in Mark 10.11 and Luke 16.18 say, that if you... If you've been divorced and you remarry, you commit adultery and cause the person you remarry to commit adultery. Now, let me add one more thing here before I close this out. How often have we, before getting married, how often have we done this? How often have we had sexual relations with someone consummating what is supposed to be only done in a marriage, but not going through the marriage ceremony? Every one of those we if we're Christians, we see those as sin, and rightfully so. So we should see even when we covenant in marriage and have sex and then break that and go marry someone else, there's deeper things going on here that God designed. That's why it's a covenant. That's why it reflects Him. He doesn't want the brokenness and the rebonding and the brokenness and the rebonding. But there's grace, and we need to understand that. Now, I want to share something with you about all this that really drives the point home before I close this out with the strongest part of it. Note that with regard to all of this, when the Jewish leaders were trying to trick Jesus about marriage and divorce, Jesus didn't go back to the law where he allowed Moses, God allowed Moses, a writing of divorce. He went back to creation. Look at his answer. He didn't go, well, the law says. He went back to creation because what was he there to do? redeem and restore all of creation. So he went back to what this it was intended and what it was going to be again, not apart from the law. If you divorce, you're in sin. If you remarry, you're in sin. Why? Because don't you know, Matthew 19, 4 through 6, don't you know that in the beginning, ooh, creation, not the law, perfection, creation, covenant. Don't you know that in the beginning we created them male and female, and for this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife's sexual union, but more than that, physiological, social, emotional, mental, everything. And the two will become one. And then Jesus added something else to completely refute the happiness interpretations. What God has put together, let no man tear apart. That's the covenant order and design from the beginning. That's what I've come to restore. Please take it seriously because marriage impacts everything else. Relationships and sexuality, as we're finding out in our culture, impacts everything else. And we need to take it that seriously. Please understand this as I close this out. Remember, divorce and remarriage are sins, but they're not the unpardonable sin. They're Think about that. If they were, how many times without the legal marriage, committing fornication, as it used to be called, promiscuity and cohabitation, have people entered into a sexual union, consummated what should have been a marriage, as I said earlier, and then broke that? Uh, Mike uh, McManus, who wrote uh, several books and has been in my office, uh, talked about, the, he called those many, M-I-N-I, plus many, M-A-N-Y, mm -hmm. many, many, divorces, all right? That's what we're dealing with we, because we've broken God's covenant. And when we do it before marriage, we're still doing the same thing. We just haven't let the public know yet, even though several do, likewise. So divorce and remarriage are not the impartable sin. When I have this conversation with people in churches that will go, well, that means it's the act itself. I go, no, because that means we now have, he knew that people were going to divorce. He allowed for it in the law. It still happened. He dealt with a woman. Paul dealt with it in marriage. It, it, the issue of 1 Corinthians 7, 6 and 7, leading up to that. And he, he, they even talked about if a single person burns with desire, it is better that they marry and not burn with lust. Not let it go into lust, pornea. Okay? It's, I've given you a perfect plan for that if you will take marriage seriously 
and entered into that covenant seriously. It's better for you to do that than to burn. And they go, yeah, he's talking to singles. I said, so am I. I'm not talking to people that are married and going bigamy or polygamy. He goes, no, not been married before. I go, where in the context of the scripture does it say that? There's forgiveness. So what do you do? Any of you out there willfully sin? I can see your hands flying up now along with mine, right? So what do we do when we willfully sin? Even if we didn't know at the time, we went into it, maybe you didn't even know it was a sin. Might have been ignorant, but we willfully did it. Still a sin, okay? What happens when we know it's wrong, we still do it? Not that any of us ever done that, right? Okay? But here's the point. My, my friend and, and brother Jeff Hancock is waving his hands on all this, right? Like you guys are, like I am, all right? But here, here's the deal. What do we do when we've sinned? And we're convicted of it. And we know it. Even, even when we knew it going into it and we did it, what is there for us? The blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. For if we confess our sins, he has shed his blood, and he is faithful and just to confess, to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Divorce is unrighteous. It's a sin. What's he cleansing us of? Remarriage is committing adultery. That's a sin. What does his blood cleanse us of? What does that then do? In every one of our sins, it completely washes away the sin and the unrighteousness. It sets us free, and now we can move forward in the freedom in Christ. But let me say one thing, repeat one thing again. Don't use his grace and his forgiveness as a license to sin. Take marriage and sexuality and loving relationships seriously, especially keeping the sexuality in marriage, in the covenant of marriage. Take them all seriously and we will begin to see what God designed in that covenant and how we can live it out to show the world what that looks like. We, the, the church needs to stand much stronger on this so that we don't, we, our numbers don't mirror, in many cases, the culture. We need to have stronger marriages and families because it will make the church stronger, again, in God's covenant order and by his design, so that the world will see something different. Not We've already seen what your marriages are like. They're going to be going, wow, how do we do that? Because we've lived it according to his truth and his covenant order. Uh, you, you, when you follow through in, in the confession and asking repentance and asking for that forgiveness, you are now free in Christ. Move forward in that freedom. Not to sin, but to be empowered to walk in that truth and that righteousness. That's what Jesus came to do, to save us and empower us to walk as his disciples. That's what the world needs to see in all things especially in our marriages, our families, in sexuality, and true loving relationships according to God's covenant order. I look forward to your comments or questions. I think I'll probably get some on this, okay? So I hope we do, and I'd love to get the conversation with you about that. I said, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to share a powerful story that the Holy Spirit used to convert. He's done it many times in this office, but he did it once in Africa 10 years ago. And I'm going to share it. It'll be almost on the anniversary of the day it happened 10 years ago when we share next um, next Friday, which will be the 20th. It actually happened on the 16th of November 2010. So almost 10 years to the day. Check out the full article, video, and other podcasts and, and, and videos at www.loveandworship.com. I do have, and I want to follow up with this. It won't take me but a couple minutes. I always like to do a little interaction. I'm thinking about calling this the counseling corner or the mentoring minute, okay? So in your feedback, don't forget that. Tell me what you like or if you've got a, a great title for it. Tell me what you think about it. Counseling Corner, Mentoring Minute. This is one of the most prevalent and very prominent, did I say very, I meant extremely prominent issues with regard to marriage, extended family, and controversy and in-laws. And I'm not just saying in-laws in general, although that's one of them. And there are many reasons for that. And we need to learn how to love in such a way that we encompass this in God's love, Okay. But as I always try to make the connection with today's teaching, this leads oftentimes to hardness of heart. Because here's the issue, and this is the number one. It's, it's not the only one, so yours may be a little different. So take the principles and the issues because they don't change. They will work if you'll follow God's truth and covenant order and design and apply it, okay? This is a true story from my, from my wife and my mom. And I've shared it with others, with, and they know it. But years ago, early in our marriage, my mom and my wife did, and still don't, and that's okay. They don't always see eye to eye. They love each other dearly, and they've learned to grow in that. But early on, my mom, when that would happen, uh, my mom would get frustrated and upset, and my wife would get that way. So what happens? We begin to have all kinds of conflict, 
all right? That leads to hardness of heart if we don't deal with it. And so what, eventually I realized that this was tearing things down. And so I told my wife, I'm going to go talk to my mom, then I'm going to come back and I'll talk with you about this because I, I, I need to share it with her first. So I went to her and I said, Mother, you need to know this because you taught me this. When you and Amy are in conflict, I don't care who's right or wrong. I'm always going to choose her. You make it an issue about right and wrong and go, well, I'm on your side. And I, I don't even care about that at the moment. Mm -hmm. What I care about is honoring the marriage relationship, which has to be the most important. And then if we do that, then we'll come back and hopefully lovingly, with the proper support, lovingly deal with the issues. And whichever one of you realizes that you're wrong on that, you can humble yourself and walk through that. But know this, if you don't accept this, all you're doing in these conflicts and standing on right rather than the loving relationship in the marriage, which I have to keep above our relationship now as mother and son, you will drive a wedge in all these relationships. That, that's the way it goes. And let me, by the way, let me add a caveat here or an addition, I should say. You know when this heightens? When, when you and your marriage and your wife have children, the greatest conflict is between wife and their mother-in-law. Okay, it's, it's not enough that you took their little boy or whatever, their firstborn son or whatever it may be. You now, are, you now have three mothers usually in the picture, at least three, and two of those mothers have known each other the whole lifetime of your wife, her mother. Your mom is now coming in. You just got to recognize these dynamics and recognize how the enemy wants to use it. So go back to God's principles. Two to three weeks later, I went back and told my wife the same thing. She was very appreciative, helped her to see things a little differently, helped my mom to see things a lot differently, and she came back two or three weeks later, give her all the credit humbly, and said, I'm really glad you shared that with me and, and, and encouraged me in that because I do realize that I did teach you that and you do need to keep the marriage first and I need to be careful about the way I come at it and then we'll deal with the right and wrong in a loving relationship, not with a wedge in it. God blessed that tremendously, not only in all that dynamic, but between my, my mom and my wife. And I thank him for that. He will bless you too if you do the same thing. Here are four action items based on today's message, all right? Number one, if you are married, moving towards marriage or moving toward divorce and potentially remarriage, consider the seriousness of God's covenant order and his word and how you are viewing marriage, like the world or according to his word. That takes some thought and prayer. Number two, ask the Lord to help and give you insights to value the honor that he has placed on marriage and how you can respond accordingly to all things related. Relationships, dating, sex, pornea, engagement, covenant marriage, divorce, remarriage. Keep his truth at the forefront. Ask him to help you understand the seriousness of what he's done in that covenant and the impact that they have on marriage itself as you are approaching it, okay? And how you approach it. Number three, Ask the Holy Spirit to help you reconsider any of those items we just talked about in 1 and 2 as he bring them, brings them to your mind so you will think and act in line with God's word and his will. He will bless that. He's there for you with grace when you miss it. But he wants to bless if you walk with him. And his grace allows you to do that. Walk in his truth. Number four, the final one, trust the Lord, his word, and his spirit to give you wisdom, humility. You're going to need it, okay? strength and courage to see and act in such a way that you honor marriage as he designed and desired for you and for all of us to do. They're not easy issues. And a matter of fact, hardness of heart is because these evoke very highly emotional responses. And they come from the deep relationships of trust and intimacy that are called into question at best and destroyed at worst. And that's what the enemy wants to do. However, however, as I've stated before, while our emotions are God's gift to help us discern and decide, they should never lead us. We should bring them under the self-control of the Holy Spirit and God's Word and allow Him to lead. We can always trust Him to work for the best outcomes as we walk by faith according to His Word and His will. When it comes to pain and struggles and hardness of heart and relationships, and in particular in marriage, are you willing to allow your emotions to guide you 
or walk in faith, trusting in God's truth. If you need help on any of that, contact me, 229-6504, 859-229-6504, or loveandmortship at gmail.com, or the comments right here. You can private, privately message me, okay? I've got a, a Facebook page as well. Uh, again, quotes and scriptures and comments, these will all be in the full article, not in the comments. There'll be a few things in the comments, but not those. Um, please continue to pray for us. Year in, thank you for your prayers and support. If the Lord is laying love and worship and this message and this ministry on your heart and it's helping you or others, please consider giving one time, a couple times a year. Monthly is great. gives us a foundation. Thank you. And if not, please ask him where he is leading you to give. Be faithful. I want you to be blessed in that, okay? God will take care of us. He always has. But if you want to be a part of that, we certainly thank you for that. Um, love and worship is here to help you live joyfully and have healthy and fulfilling relationships in the love and worship of Jesus Christ. We don't charge for any of this. So you call us or contact us if you'd like to know more about that. We desire to make disciples who make disciples in every home and church in the love and worship of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks always to the Lord. Have a great day and a Thanksgiving season in Christ. And God bless.